Welcome back to the Natural Kitchen Podcast. I'm Christine, and in this episode, I'm speaking with Jared Kraywitz. I'm really excited about this one as Jared is passionate about farming and has great insights about the topic of regenerative agriculture. Let me know in the comments if this topic interests you. Jared is a farmer at Closter Farm and Livestock Company in Closter, New Jersey. He came to farming relatively late in life. After cooking in New York City, he moved to North Carolina where he apprenticed at Fickle Creek Farm, learning the basics of low stress animal management, rotational grazing, pasture health, crop planning, market gardening, and much more. After the apprenticeship, he moved to Hopewell, New Jersey to manage the poultry program at Double Brook Farm. When the opportunity came to start Closter Farm, Jared jumped at the chance to rejuvenate a piece of land in an amazing community. I'm quite the advocate of regenerative agriculture, so super excited for today's show. Welcome, Jared. Tell us a little bit about who you are and how you got involved in Closer Farm. Thank you so much for having me, Christine. Such a wonderful opportunity to, to share on your channel here. Yeah, I think you captured the high level pretty, pretty nicely there. I uh, did not come from an agricultural background at all. And my journey to farming was from a business angle at first, uh, right out of school, and then, you know, in a kitchen setting, and then finally uh, in agriculture itself. And the style of agriculture that we practice here in Closter Farm is something I kind of had to find through a series of different jobs because everyone kind of has their own definition of what it means to be regenerative or green or organic even. And that can even go for farms that are certified organic like we are, um, farms that may call themselves organic but not certified and so on. So I'm just trying to figure out what the label says and then what actually happens in practice on farms that may not meet at face value what most people think regenerative means. Mm -hmm. Well, I, uh, I helped start Closter Farm um, about two and a half, three years ago now, coming up on three years, which is crazy. And we've been building an awesome little project here, growing about an acre of vegetables. And we also raise chickens on pasture here. In our second year, we were able to get some land in upstate New York. The Closter Farm is in Closter, New Jersey, which is Bergen County, about 15 minutes to the George Washington Bridge into New York City, just for anyone who's not um, familiar with the area. About two hours north of us, we have some extra acreage where we raise cattle as well. And that started last year and something we're just trying to expand into and, and figure out ways to make that both logistically work, but also from an agricultural standpoint, work really well. We have been certified organic uh, since our first year here. So it's all three years of operation. We've been certified organic. And I would classify us as a regenerative farm. And I'm, I'm going to talk about lowercase and uppercase letters at some point to differentiate between those farms, as I was mentioning, that might say we are organic, but may, may not be certified organic. So certified organic farm would use a capital O. Uh, there are no certified regenerative farms. There's no body that organizes or uh, collaborates with the government or farmers in any way to state that you are a certified regenerative farm. So when I say regenerative, I write it with a lowercase r to indicate that there is no certification and that you know the definition may be a little different here than it is elsewhere. That's so interesting. Wow. You shed light on my next question, which was what is regenerative agriculture? So you kind of touched on a little bit about that. Anything you want to expand on as far as the different types of regenerative agriculture? Sure. Sure. So much like the original uh, purpose of certified organic, regenerative farming is a statement that I believe is meant to belie the point that an organization or an operation is giving more to the land in terms of nutrients, in terms of care, in terms of increasing robustness and diversity in the ecosystem in which the agricultural operation is operating. And then it takes away. So a net positive for the environment, for the ecology, for all the things that the farm is not making money off of. So that could be trees the farm is never going to cut down. That could be flowers that people don't find beautiful, but are fantastic pollinators. It could be weeds 
that are, are good food for pollinators or animals that could end up being pests to the farmer, but are an integral part of the ecosystem and without which the ecosystem would suffer. So a regenerative farm, in my opinion, and by my definition, I'm not saying this is definition for everybody and check with your local farmer who's staying their regenerative is that I, I as a regenerative farmer try to and do my best to give back to my ecosystem more than I take out of it. So you, the second part of your question was, what are some types of regenerative agriculture? And this is a broad question, and I could go a lot of ways with this. So wh what I'm going to try to do here is to say, whether you are a dairy farmer raising cattle on grass uh, and milking, um, or making cheese or yogurt, ice cream, any of those products, a cattle farmer rancher who is harvesting their cattle for meat, a chicken farmer or poultry farmer raising any poultry, that's ducks, uh, turkeys, geese, chickens, guinea hens, on and on, anything you'd find at the grocery store or specialty butcher shop. And then produce, of course, and then you could go into the grains markets, corn, soybeans. These are not, like, just because a crop is on the mass market and because the idea of it may be bad in the mass market doesn't mean it can't be done in a regenerative way. So you can grow anything on the planet in a regenerative manner, as long as the, you know, the end result is after a farming season. So whenever your season ends and winter hits, your soil, your environment has received net more than you had taken out of it. And by taking out of it, I mean to say, when you allow a cow to graze on a field of grass, you can allow that cow to graze down the grass to any height. And ranchers uh, debate constantly about what height of grass to allow their cattle to graze it to uh, before they move their cattle. Some biologists say that cattle in a entirely natural setting, of which there are none left. There are no natural settings for us to study this anymore. So it's an hypothesis that cattle would only munch on the top few inches, which they say are the most tender because it's the newest growth and have the most nutrition, typically because they're seed heads or um, because it's that new growth. It has all of that you know, vibrancy and, and new nutrition. And then they would march on to their next patch of grass and constantly be moving. In a ranch setting, you need to protect your cattle. Either, either that would be from you know predators or poachers, even people who don't believe in agriculture and may want to release them, uh, may not want to, you know, take them for themselves. But there are all sorts of reasons you want to keep your cattle safe. The second thing is that however smart cattle are, and they are quite smart, um, cows never get their due. But, uh, you know, if you let a herd of cattle kind of decide where they're going, they could destroy the land where they go. A lot of cattle is a lot of weight. It's just huge amounts of mass moving across the land. So they could cause some destruction, whether that's someone's backyard, a vegetable patch, a field of corn that's meant for human consumption, whatever it may be. But you need to direct these cattle in a particular way and you need to protect them. So you then have to decide how tall or short to leave this grass. In a regenerative setting, you're going to allow those cattle to eat as little bit of the grass as possible for moving them on, which is to say you want them to eat some. You want them to get their nutrition on that pasture to digest that and then poop it out, which is a fantastic source of nitrogen, you know, natural composting. And you're recycling all that beautiful matter and you're telling the pasture to perform more photosynthesis. And you can start to think about fields of grass as green solar panels in which they are extracting carbon dioxide out of the uh, atmosphere through photosynthesis and producing glucose and growing more grass. Now, this is getting a little wonky, but just to say, if you're in a non-regenerative setting, those cattle will be allowed to graze that grass all the way down, and then they'd be fed corn. And there would be no thought process to how is the pasture doing? The only thought process would be how fast are the cattle gaining weight and how much money can we make how quickly? In a regenerative setting, you're saying, how much grass are they eating? At what rate? Which grasses are they eating more of and less of? At what times of year? Are certain cows pregnant? Is it time to mate the cattle together to have in to 
integrate the bulls into the herd? How is that impacting things? Did we have a rainy season last year, which is making clover overgrow sorghum Sudan grass? And all of this thought process goes into managing not just the cattle, but also the pasture. And in that mindset, you are now working on two factors instead of just one. One factor would be our bottom line. The only thing that matters is our bottom line. Let's get there as quickly as we can. In a regenerative setting, in terms of cattle, you're thinking about both factors. And I'm not going to do this for everything because that would take forever, but uh, you can extrapolate this now out to vegetables. You can extrapolate it to grains. You can extrapolate it to, to dairy and on and on and on. So anything you can grow can be done regeneratively as long as it's in that mindset. That's amazing. And I love what you said about the soil quality and the nitrogen rich soil. I originally got into veganism a long time ago for environmental reasons. And there's that misnomer out there that cows are burping or passing gas, or whatever, and that it's not good for the ozone layer. And then when I heard about regenerative farming and how cows are actually an integral part of soil creation and that we've lost a lot of our top soil and we need to be yep. you know, recreating that, I thought, wow, this is this is really fascinating. It's like a different uh, take on environmentalism. So I loved everything you shared. Yeah, absolutely. There's some fantastic TED Talks and other um, speeches and, and classes online by Alan Savory, uh, to name one, who talks about regenerating uh, sections of sub-Saharan African pastures with animals and how when animals were taken off the pasture, the pastures did worse. But when animals were reintegrated into the pastures and managed appropriately in a regenerative manner, the pastures came back very quickly, obliterating uh, all sorts of issues, including drought, famine, subsoil issues, and topsoil loss. So it just having animals on the land in a good way is always going to be better than not having animals. Fascinating. Wow. Now, uh, I've heard that there are five basic principles right. involved in regenerative farming. So maybe you can talk a bit about those. Sure. I, I was never, uh, you know, admittedly never taught in a classroom um, what regenerative farming is. It's more been, a, you know, a search on my own through uh, the internet and then speaking with tons of other farmers who either claim to practice it or, or are really huge people in the field of regenerative agriculture. So I, I can list so five principles, but my one principle is really all boiling back down to as long as your operation gives more back than it takes in terms of soil health, nutrition to the ecosystem and allows the ecosystem to flourish. And, you know, maybe that's three of the five right there. And the other two, I would say that are especially important to Closter Farm are supports your community. So it's, it works with your community in such a way that you're not asking people to radically change the way they live to make regenerative farming work. Like Closter is a suburban environment and you could take this to the nth degree and say, well, I need all of your front and backyards to be used in regenerative agriculture. That wouldn't be very uh, polite or um, a, a good way of ingratiating yourself or this business to all of your neighbors. So knowing kind of where to draw the line and how to you know, create the most influence would be another principle. I think that's four principles so far. So the fifth principle I would say is regenerative agriculture needs to be economically viable too. And in some cases that can mean that you charge more for your product, much like you would with certified organic products, because that allows you to sacrifice some of the things that non-regenerative farmers gain on their bottom line. Remember, if they're always driving to their bottom line, then they're not considering all the things we are. Unfortunately, I can't sell customers on the idea that I now have more Blue Jays on my farm than I did two years ago, even though I love it. And I'm sure they love the outcome of that. It's not a saleable thing. So the only real way for uh, regenerative agriculture to exist in the world is for it to be supported by its community and for it to be profitable enough in, um, you know, in the current economic environment that uh, people can continue to do it and the idea of it can proliferate. Yeah. And I've always felt like your prices are reasonable for the quality of product that you guys have there. Thank you. 
yeah, everything I've ever gotten there has been amazing. And you can see like the love and care behind it and taste it too. So, um, how about just your philosophy, your general philosophy? We, we don't necessarily call ourselves regenerative on all aspects because it's not a certified word. We are a certified organic, as I said. So the thing we always drive towards here is that we think about this business as a triple bottom line business, which you may, if you're an MBA or you've worked in accounting at all, you have your first bottom line, which is, are you, are you making money or are you not making money? It's the first one. The second one typically is people. So are we bringing more to our community than we are taking out? And then you could bring that, you know, outside of that. Are we bringing more to our community and every community we work with? So you could look at something like the iPhone, which brings a lot to the people who use them, but has also been finger pointed at for how it's made and where the things that make it come from. Um, as an example, I'm not calling out uh, Apple here, but just as an example. So you can then go down the line and say, if we're buying compost from another property, is that property also encompassing all of these philosophies? Is that uh, company treating its employees well and thinking about its environment and all the things that you would hope you know, is happening on your business, you're trying to work with equally good businesses. So second one is community. That's our second tenant. And um, that's our community, but also the worldwide community in terms of who we interact with. And our third philosophy is ecology and ecosystem. So every single year we soil test. And what that looks like is we, we dig about six inches down into the soil and we get a smattering, usually about 20 to 25 samples, uh, which is a little clump of soil. And we put that all in a bucket, mix it all together, and then we dry it out, and then we send it into a lab. And our local lab is Rutgers University. And there they perform some exams and tests on it, and they extract um, what nutrient levels are in it. So they're looking for the big three, N, P, and K, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, which are the three most important nutrients to the macronutrients in plant growth. If ever you've gone to a gardening store or bought compost and seen three numbers on the front of a bag, those are those three numbers, N, P, and K. They also tell us all the micronutrients in them. So that's zinc, selenium, thiamine, manganese, iron, on and on on and on all through the list. Someone in your audience may be deficient in one of those things and had headaches or their bones hurt or their nails aren't growing back properly. It's all these little, little things. And I'm talking about less than one in a million particles, sometimes less than one in a billion particles are these nutrients, but you need them. That's why they're there. If the body doesn't have them, then it won't operate as well as it could. The vegetables won't grow as robustly and beautifully as they could, and the body won't function as well as it could. So these all tie in together. And the reason I'm constantly mentioning both at once is because we're eating this food. And the reason we're eating it is because we're trying to get those nutrients. And the nutrients that we're trying to get out of the vegetables have to come from somewhere. And they're either coming from the water, the air, or the soil. And the soil is the majority of it. So we test the soil and then we see, you know, what are we doing well? How much of this do we need? How much of that do we need? And then we can see where in the field we need to apply a little more of this or a little more of that to make sure that the plants have more than enough of whatever they need for the next growing season. And then we're also doing qualitative studies. So like I was saying with the Blue Jays, and we're just looking around and seeing, do we have more insects? Do we have more uh, groundhogs? Do we have fewer groundhogs? Do we have more rabbits? Do we have more swallows? Do we have more butterflies? Do we have more praying mantises? And generally, our trend has been up and to the right. It's just more and more every year. So that's a really good feeling. And you could absolutely get uh, a biologist or some expert to come out and study this and tell you exactly how many you have. But you know, just looking each year, it's pretty obvious uh, how much more life we have on the farm than in years past. And just that can tell you a lot in terms of if there's a vibrancy of life, that means there's ample, you know, base level food for the lowest prey. You know, we're talking about worms. If there's good stuff to eat in the soil for worms, 
then there's going to be a lot of worms. If there's a lot of worms, there's going to be a lot of small birds. If there's a lot of small birds, then there might be more bigger birds to eat the smaller birds and on and on and on. So it's really about focusing on that base layer soil and, and making sure that everything we do feeds back into healthier soil year on year. That's wonderful. So you guys are really taking great care of uh, the land, the ecosystem. I think there have been some really great books recently about how um, soil health and gut health are very similar to one another. How I've, I've, as we've seen soil health on average degrade across the world, we've also seen people have more GI problems, more cancer, all of these things. And that's a correlation. It's not a causal situation. I can't claim there's statistics to say it's causal or science to back that up. But we've, we've seen a correlation. What we also know is that a lot of the things that live in the soil that digest, if you drop a pepper on the ground, eventually it's going to turn into soil. So all the creatures, the microbiology, the mycorrhizae, all the fungal stuff that breaks down is very similar to what exists in our gut system, in our stomachs that helps us digest all of the things that we're eating, like a pepper. And the healthier that soil ends up being, the more easy it is for us to digest this food, which is why sometimes if you were eating really healthy and then you go and have like a cheat meal or, you know, you go on a nice date or something and you go eat some processed food, you might not feel so great the next day because the quality of the food, even though you may have paid more for it, the quality of the food actually isn't as good because it's less packed with nutrients and more packed with other stuff. So the importance of soil quality really comes down to health. Um, The healthier our soil, the healthier we will be. So when I am asked typically you know, should I be buying organic or do you live your whole life organic or do you only eat regenerative food? My answer is no. I mean, there's so, so many farmers in this world who have no idea what organic is or regenerative is. And I'm talking globally, but also in the United States. And that's okay. You don't have to be certified organic or know what the term regenerative means to grow really, really high quality food. What you need to do is focus on your soil health. So anytime someone asks, you know, where should I shop? I live here. You can Google nearly anything these days. I will say farmers are uh, notoriously hard to find on the internet because um, although we're not all Luddites, a lot of us eschew technology to any degree possible in favor of trying to be outside as much as possible. So it may be a little more difficult to find someone But if you go to your local farmer's market, or maybe you go to that quirky person at the end of the street who has a fantastic garden that you've always ogled, and just start chatting with them about where they source their plants from, you can follow that chain and you'll probably find a really, really great farm a lot closer than you thought with really high quality produce. And again, it does not matter if it's certified organic, it does not matter if it is regenerative or if it's they if they're using all these terms what matters is are they paying attention to the quality of their soil and is the quality of their soil on equal footing with their bottom line and if that is the case then you should spend all of your food dollars there yeah you think about amish farmers or generational farmers who passed down the knowledge did you say you didn't you didn't study per se or you didn't you weren't no no, I uh, I went to Bates College, which is a small liberal arts school in Maine. I studied economics and Japanese. So I, I have no background in agriculture. My parents were both uh, professionals. I grew up at, at just outside of Boston. So I, I have zero background in agriculture. Everything I've learned uh, has been either through personal research, going to conferences, and my experience working on farms for other people. That's great. Wow. That's, that's really impressive. So it's really just like your passion for farming. So <laughs> that's wonderful. Now, some people might wonder, does regenerative agriculture really work? What would you say to that? We don't know. We don't know. What we know is regenerative agriculture is as close to indigenous practices from around the globe, which is to say we use things like cover cropping, rotational 
um, grazing and crop rotations. We are always on the move. We use things like biochar, which would mimic slash and burn techniques. So what we know is from atmospheric studies, historical atmospheric studies, that only after the Industrial Revolution and second did we start to experience rapid decay in our ozone layer. And really only recently as we became extremely efficient in producing materials that would do this. Prior to that, there were no spikes in CO2 levels in the atmosphere. They're really, to the best of my knowledge, scientists don't know of ozone decay prior to truly recent history. So what we know is what indigenous people were doing was great for the environment. The, the ecology was fantastic. The soil quality was really good. So a lot of what we do is a modernized, we as regenerative farmers, is a modernized version of uh, indigenous practices. And they're sampled from all over the globe. And I could give credit to any number of individual groups and tribes and such. But the important thing is to note that they were all doing a pretty darn good job before machinery came around. And um, this is not to say that you know machinery is bad. When used in a good way, it can be even better. But coming back to does it work? I would say scientifically, there is not proof that it works holistically. But qualitatively, yeah, it works. And quantitatively, based on our soil inspections and soil reports, yeah, it really works. You know, we have seen our organic matter, which is the amount of soil bound carbon, which means you know we are taking carbon out of the atmosphere through photosynthesis and drawing it into the soil, has increased some five or 10 times in three years. So that's a pretty good indicator that what we're doing has worked pretty well. And the other thing I'll say is, in order to produce all that, we have only purchased about, I think we're around $1,000 in fuel costs over these last three years. That's not per year, that's not per month, that's $1,000 in fuel for three years of operation. That does not include all the trucks that come to and from to deliver certain things. It doesn't include all of our customers to and from. It doesn't include my personal use, my employees' personal use, but it does include all of our tractor and machinery on the farm. So it is not a holistic study, but that is to say this farm is not producing more carbon than it sequesters. So yeah, it works. Boy, that I would say so. That's impressive. Those are really impressive numbers. How about your team there? How many people do you have? And what are some of the roles and responsibilities of the other farmers? Yeah, great question. So my business partner, John, is the owner. Uh, he purchased the farm with his family in late 2019. Um, we connected through a farm matching website, basically for uh, people who are looking to run farms and operate farms and people who have a piece of land and uh, don't have any experience or, you know, don't really know what to do with it yet. So he's one of the other farmers and we work together a majority of the time these days on things like capital investments, business decisions, analyzing the performance of the business, all the hiring we do together, a lot of the marketing we do together. And then John also helps us a ton in the field. He calls himself the number one intern and uh, is a, a great help when he can make it out. Then we have AJ Albanos, who is our um, propagation and field manager. He handles all of the seeding and propagation. So we grow about 95% of everything we sell here from seed. The only things we really buy in um, every year are grafted tomatoes, although we're considering not doing that anymore. So pretty much everything you buy at the store or see around the farm was started from seed by one of us, but mostly AJ. He then nurtures those all the way through their life cycle in the field, getting them from the prop room out to harden off and then into the ground and then feeds them throughout and uh, takes care of them, manages them for pests, and then passes them on for a harvest. And then Alec Radiosian is our post-harvest and uh, wholesale manager. 
So everything that comes out of the field goes across his desk, basically. He sees every bunch, every blade of grass, and make sure it's not in your salad mix. Uh, we try to clean everything to the best of our ability. By clean, I'm, you know, we're not trying to wash off pesticides, but uh, we're trying to you know, make it look as pretty as we can because the first thing customers do when they come in is they eat with their eyes. So we want to make sure things look really nice and neat and tidy. And the other nice thing is if we can compete with Whole Foods, which is just down the road from us in any particular way, it really helps us. So having greens that don't need to be washed necessarily when they get home is a, you know, a big added benefit that not many people assume happens at a farm. And then he also handles any wholesale orders for caterers and restaurants we work with on that kind of basis. Then we have a team which grows and shrinks with the season. But at the peak of the season, we had, I think it was five other people here total, but the total man hours was about three full-time equivalents. So a a bunch of part-timers kind of piecing together some stuff. It was a really great team this year. We grew more food than we ever have, and it, it was a lot of fun. Well, I'm amazed. It's a relatively small team of people to do what you guys do and to create the wonderful products that you have. So that's that's just great. Anything else you'd like to share, Jared? It's been so fascinating talking with you about this topic. I've been interested in it for a while, and I thought, Jared's the guy I got to interview about this. Oh, thanks so much, Christine. No, I mean, it's been great meeting so many wonderful people, you know, especially you included, just people who are inquisitive and asking good questions and trying to understand and get a little more closely connected with their food. And it's really nice to be that conduit through which people can bring their kids or themselves and have a tour or take a class, stay with us on the farm, whatever it may be, however they like to slice it, or just come and shop with us each week. Just being able to show people how much you can grow in Northern New Jersey, what a wide variety it can be, and why you know, although the growers in Mexico and Canada are fantastic people, we don't necessarily need to be shipping in those products. And especially from California, uh, there's more than enough people in California who can be eating all that food. And uh, it's pretty cool to be able to demonstrate to our community that, you know, you could, you could basically subsist entirely off of what it can actually be grown seasonally here in Jersey and not in a skimpy way. You can eat like a king or queen and be very, very happy every day of the week, every meal, snacks included. And, you know, sometimes it takes a little more creativity for those who aren't used to cooking in the kitchen, but that's been a really, really fun thing. And uh, if this talk has left you with the nagging question of, okay, like what can I do next? My answer to your question is go buy food from the most local best farm you can find. Um, Create a relationship with your local farmer and support them as much as you can. And if that's 10% of your food budget, fine. If that's 95%, great. It doesn't matter how much it is. As long as you're giving something to them, then we can continue to grow. But the more we continue to allow Grubhub and DoorDash and Whole Foods to beat out local agriculture with convenience, with deliveries, with online ordering. Even though you might lose 30 minutes efficiency, maybe 45 minutes, maybe you might stand in a line you aren't going to stand in or be a little colder than you were, you're going to eat so much better quality food It's going to taste better. It's going to make you feel better. And it's going to be grown by someone who really cares, who you can connect a face to and whose hand you can shake. Uh, And that's pretty cool. That's really cool. So for those of you in any vicinity of Closter, New Jersey, in the New York metro area, please stop by Closter Farm and check them out, what you guys have to offer. And where else can we find out more about you guys and your website? You want to share your social media? Yeah, yeah. So we're Closter underscore farm uh, on Instagram and Facebook. And then we are just ClosterFarm.com, C-L-O-S-T-E-R-F-A-R-N, that might be backwards, uh, dot com. And yeah, uh, if you search Organic Farm Bergen County, Organic Farm New Jersey, we should come up on your Google search. And we'd love to meet you and see you in chat. Awesome. All right. Well, thanks again, Jared. This was a wonderful Thanks so much, Christine. So appreciate it. 
Thank you.